Well, thank you for that super kind introduction, Mare. The feeling is very, very much mutual. I'm so happy that Mare came into my world. And it's um, I, this is my third time presenting to this wonderful crew of people. And full disclosure, I actually have to go on a podcast later today. And this this presentation and being with you guys, I was like, no, 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 they're my crew. Like, we're good. Like, we can just be normal and fun and have a good time. And so it really does feel like I'm I'm hanging out with a group of friends. And so thank you all for that. So my name is Susanna. I spent 10 years as a trial lawyer. And what that meant was I did go to court and fight in courtrooms, but I also had to go to arbitrations and small claims court. And I was constantly dealing with people who were mad at each other. And I've, I have a confession to make you guys. I wasn't particularly good at controlling my emotions when it happened. And I was much better if I had to defend somebody else or, or, you know, actually we talk about having a sword or a shield in law and the people who have the sword are the ones who would be on the plaintiff side in civil law. And the people with the shield are the ones who are on the defense side. And I was mainly holding my shield, but even if I had to get my sword out, I was so much better when it wasn't me. And the, I had, I actually carried a lot of shame about that, which has since gone like this shame is not invited. But what I've discovered since starting my own business is that it's, it's a different ball game when someone is mad at you and you're not working for a corporation. It's a totally different ball game when it is your livelihood, your business, your identity that is suddenly coming at like coming under fire. And so I've had to learn and I have learned successfully to figure that out. I'm going to share some really cool tricks with you guys today. And um, I'm just really stoked to share this with you guys because the, like with everything I share, I always think this is something I would have been able to use X amount of years ago, five, 10 years ago. And so I just am hoping that this is going to serve you as much as it has served me. So, all right, a client is angry with you. Here is how to handle it. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to cover three ways to get your nervous system to chill out. And I'm going to talk about why that's important in a second. The next thing I'm going to talk to you guys about is how to figure out if the client has a point or if they're just, as my British husband would say, throwing their toys out of the pram, right? Are they just throwing a temper tantrum or do we have a problem? And then I'm going to give you guys my top five do's and don'ts for dealing with an angry client. And I'm going to try to pack the value in as much as I can. I love conversation. So if you guys have questions, feel free to stick your hand up, stick it in the chat. Um, this can be very informal. I am here to help and serve you guys. And I've blocked off 90 minutes. So um, I, I'm just here for you and please do not be shy. And of course there'll be Q&A at the end, but don't worry about interrupting me because I can either go off on a tangent myself and get myself back on track, or you can take me off on a tangent that helps you and I'll get myself back on track. So with all of that said, let's get started. Um, just a reminder, conflict. So conflict is a very subjective experience. And I talk a lot about a conflict threshold. My conflict threshold right now is, so the conflict threshold is the difference between a conflict that's going to set you off, you know, a conflict that's going to make your nervous system go all haywire or something that's just going to be a conversation and kind of like a no biggie. It's not going to be something that makes the dinner table conversation late at night because it's just, it's just not a problem. But where conflict becomes an issue is when your conflict threshold gets breached. And that's when you start to have a negative emotional reaction to the situation. And that's where things start to get really blurry. That's where our judgment starts to go haywire. And that's where we start to feel a lot like we are under a, th a threat. And we know because a lot of us follow TikTok and social media, there are, you know, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn responses to these things. None of those are very good for business. So what we want to do is we want to get our nervous system to chill the F out so that we can access that power that we have. Because in conflict, you always, always, always have more power than you realize. Most of the time when our conflict threshold is breached, we don't use it because we're so 
like activated. Our nervous systems are, are freaking out. So that's something that's so important to remember. So I'm going to stop sharing um, my screen for a second. And I really want to show you guys a couple of cool tools that will help you with conflict. So is there somebody who gets really anxious about conflict? Is there somebody who I see Mayor, Mayor, do you want to be, I'm, I would say my first victim, but you're not, it's like, it's going to be amazing. Okay. Mayor, can you do me a favor and think of a situation, uh, whether it's a conflict or not, but just think of something that makes you anxious. Yep. All right. Do you have it in mind? <laughs> You're right away. Yes, I have it. It's there. <laughs> yeah. But here's my list. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. So on a scale of one to 10, yeah. one is like, I'm cool as a cucumber. 10 is I am freaking, I hope everyone's cool if I swear. I, I have a sweary profession, right? I do crisis management, life coaching. Conflict is all part of that. It's a sweary profession. So 10 is I'm freaking the fuck out. Mm -hmm. Where are you at with, right now with your anxiety level? Uh, I would say 10. You're at a 10? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Can you bring it up to a 12 for me? Can I? Yeah. Like my anxiety? Yeah. Bring it up to a 12 for me. I don't know how. <laughs> Usually you can think of it and then get a little bit more. Oh, no, because I'm like at that level. Yes. I've been reaching out to you lately. <laughs> okay. All right. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take something in your hands. Okay. I'm gonna up, and I want you. I have a crystal. Amazing. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I want you to pass your crystal back and forth in front of you like this. And we're going to do this for 30 seconds. So I'm just going to have you do this, Mayor. And yeah, exactly. So we're going to have the arms going out to the side. Yeah. Now, the reason why I wanted you to turn your anxiety up and dial it up is because I wanted to send a message to your brain that you have more power than you think. And so you probably did, even though you're like, no, I can't go any higher than a 10. You probably did actually get a little bit more activated in that moment. And so that's our brains are very powerful and we don't always realize it. And I've spent the last few years learning all about this and learning about how our brains impact our behavior during conflict. And so that's one of the things I wanted to, to let you know is that we can always turn it up and we can also dial it back. So Mary, we've been doing this for about 45 seconds. Let's just pause. Where's your anxiety at now on a scale of one to 10? It's actually much lower. It sits in my stomach a lot. So just the fact that my hands were doing something that I needed to concentrate on, yeah. pulled it from my stomach. So where are you at on a scale of one to 10 now? Uh, seven. Seven. Amazing shit for me. That, that is that is a 30% drop in 45 seconds. Yeah. So if you just want to keep doing this for a second, I'm going to tell you why this works. So why this works is that when we're anxious and remember, we can be anxious about anything. It doesn't have to be conflict. It could be like, I wake up in the morning sometimes and I'm, I just wake up anxious. Like it happens. But what's happening is there's one part of our brain that's over firing. And so what we're doing, this is actually called bilateral stimulation. And you don't even have to pass an object back and forth. You can take your hands like this and just, you know, moving your body from side to side will actually send blood flow to other areas of your brain so that one area of your brain that's over firing can't keep its shit up. So Mayor, let's pause and see where you're at now. Yeah, I would say six. Amazing. So what I do with clients when they come to me and they're in this like whirlwind, you know, glass case of emotion to quote Will Ferrell in, in Anchorman, the first thing we do is we knock that shit down because I can't even take instructions from somebody. And when I say take instructions, lawyers take instructions, but I can't coach somebody if they're that hyped up, I got to get them down a little bit. And that is a tool that you guys can use anywhere. You can use it under the table when you're talking to clients who are upsetting you kids use it at schools. You know, we, we teach this to kiddos so they can do it under their desk. It's portable and it is very, very easy. So that is one tool to help your nervous system chill out. How, how do you feel now? That was fantastic. Thank you. Isn't it like stupidly yeah. easy and stupidly simple? And why didn't anyone teach us this in kindergarten? Right. right. <laughs> Hello? What's going on? Who has something that makes them angry or anxious? Can I have another person? I'll show you guys another one. Or maybe if you guys don't want to, if maybe you guys can like, if you don't want to do it on screen, let me, uh, I'll gallery view this and let's do this all together. So this is the easiest kind of uh, tapping that you can possibly do. Now I have a step kid and 
for those stepmothers in the crowd, stepkids are so special and wonderful. Like, of course, wonderful, but they also are trying. And I love my stepkid. And so we really can activate each other because we care about each other. So the other day I was stewing about something that she had said to me, and I'm not proud of this, by the way, but I am human. I have a human brain. And I use this trick because I, and I was so proud of myself for remembering to use it in the moment. I use this trick and I kid you not, you guys, I was like chill. It was nuts. I didn't know. So I'm going to walk you through how well this works. And, and again, I'm a tiny bit embarrassed because I tell clients to do this all the time. And then I didn't think to do it until I did the other day. And I was shocked. So what we're going to do, we're going to do a little bit of tapping. Uh, I usually wear glasses. They're off for this reason right now. So we're going to tap the very top of the head. Don't ask me how this works, by the way, because I just know it does. And that's like, I can, someone else can explain and the EMDR expert can explain, but as you're tapping, I usually say something to myself, like I release this shit and let it go. And I repeat that self to my, my, I repeat that to myself three times. Then I move to the next point, which is right between the eyes here. And I say the same thing. I repeat this shit and I let it go. Or I repeat, I, re I re release this shit, not repeat. I release this shit and let it go. Then you go to the side of the eye right here. I release this shit and let it go. And for me, the magic comes when I do it three times. You can do it twice, even just once. Then you're going to go right under the eye. So where the eye socket bone, which is not the actual name of the bone, but who cares? You're just going to tap there. If you have nails, don't poke yourself in the eye. And you're releasing this shit and you're letting it go. We're releasing. Then we're going to do the collarbone. I release this shit and let it go. I release this shit and let it go. Then you're gonna grab your wrist with your hand and you're gonna take a nice deep breath in and you're gonna exhale for twice as long. I already feel better. Like I wasn't even upset and I feel better. Isn't that, isn't that so cool? Like don't, do you guys notice even like, like a subtle shift right now? And it can be a big, be a big difference when you're taking yourself down from a 10 to a seven, like Meredith just did, you can see the world a lot more differently. So that is trick number two. Trick number three is so simple. And I debated whether I was going to include this with you guys. And then I got this book, um, which is called The Worst is Over. It's verbal first aid. So it's what to say when every minute counts. And they talked about the importance of this in this book. And I thought, okay, actually, I am going to share this with the group. So I'm putting my ego aside. So it's so it's criminally simple. Are you ready? Deep breathing actually works. And I'll tell you why. It's because it actually helps blood flow to the prefrontal cortex of your brain, which is the processing, reasoning, cognitive functioning area. And it helps you think things through a lot better. So there's actually magic in slowing down and just taking a deep breath. Now, I'm going to add one more trick in here because I don't want to be like, yeah, I said three and, I, and you told me to breathe, which I normally do. Thank you. So the other thing you can do, and this is how when sometimes I'll use some of these tools and tricks with my clients, when I try to get them to relax a little bit, I'll ask them just to focus on a point on the wall. I've got this like paint defect on my windowsill that I can look at. So I just focus on that point. I let my eyelids relax a little bit. Then without moving my eyes or my, my face, I'll just become more and more aware of what's in my peripheral vision. And they call this zoom out to shut up. And as you become more aware of what's in your peripheral vision, your brain cannot keep ruminating on the shit that's causing it to, to freak out. So this is so important because a lot of us, when a client is angry, we will be triggered. And whether your trigger is, you know, whatever one of the four F's is triggered with that, if we can tone that down a little bit, then everything starts to look a lot clearer. And when we're in conflict, our vision does actually narrow. And what we want to do is we want to zoom it out a little bit so we can see the big picture. And I would say 70% of any success you're going to have in a conflict is going to come from you being able to deal with your mindset. And it is such a failure in our legal profession, or profession that they don't teach us how to do this because it, it is so unbelievably important and it, it's just incredibly, it's incredibly helpful. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again and I'm hoping, okay, wait, stop share just a second. I've got to actually get myself 
to the point where I can find where I put everything. So just one sec. There we go. Okay. Um, every single Zoom call, you have somebody who's like, I'm just going to share my screen for a minute, uh, which I've said about five times. Okay. There we go. We're presenting. Okay, so we're, we've calmed the nervous system now. So those are the three things, bilateral stimulation, a very abbreviated version of EMDR. And then we have our breathing, of course. And then we have our zooming out so that our brains will calm down. Does anybody have any questions about that? As I say in meetings I run, silence is like tacit consent like we're gonna not not in every sense but in a meeting if no one speaks up then I'm gonna move on so tacit agreement not consent I should say uh okay key question whenever someone's mad at us is do they have a point so we're gonna look at a couple of things when we're looking at do they have a point now the first one even though I've got it as the second one here is the contract and a lot of people have contracts a lot of people don't always understand what the contract says because they've downloaded it from the internet. And I love me a good contract template. Like I shamelessly will go on the internet and look for contract templates for clients when I'm doing contracts for them, especially if they're in like a creative business and I've never been a creative, so I don't know what's in there. So there's no shame when it comes to a contract template, but contracts are there to help you understand the rules of the game. I think of a contract as being like in, you know, the instructions to a board game. And so when we reach an impasse at a board game and we're like, you know, you can't do that. Yes, I can. No, you can't. What do we do? We pull out the game rules and we figure it out. And then, you know, one of us is right. One of us is wrong and we move on. And that's exactly what your contract is there for. So when somebody writes to you and they say something like, hey, you didn't deliver on this and you were supposed to and blah, blah, blah. One of the first things I would do is I would go back to the contract, take a look at the part that talks about what I'm supposed to give as like what services I'm supposed to give as part of that contract and just make sure I have my ducks in a row. Um, does anybody have an example or does anyone have a specific scenario they're worried about that they want me to talk about when it comes to looking at a contract and figuring out if a client has a point? Okay, so one example might be timing. And uh, I know I've talked to a few of you and I know some of you have sort of time constraints on your projects or you know sort of deadlines that you need to meet with things. And so that's one that you can definitely go back to the contract and see what it says about timing. And if you're noticing, PS, if you're noticing that you're having a hard time meeting those deadlines in your contract, the first, like I would extend them for the next time. And then I would also reach out to the client and just let them know, like, hey, I don't know if I'm going to be able to meet this deadline. And then the question I always ask myself is, how can I be extraordinary for them in these circumstances? How can I deliver extra value? Because people, generally speaking, don't mind if you can't meet a deadline. Obviously, there's exceptions if you're giving extra value and if they feel like you care about them. The next test for whether the client has a point is the video replay test. So often when a client is mad, they will not deliver their message in a way that's very nice. It takes a very evolved person to be angry and communicate in a way that doesn't activate somebody else's nervous system. And sometimes the email will have things like threats, they'll have insults, They'll mischaracterize what you've said or what you've done. And all of those things, there'll be assumptions, all of those things will get us riled up. So what I like to do with some of these emails that people get is I'll take, I'll pause, I'll put it on my iPad and I'll grab my Apple pen. I don't work for Apple, but that's what I use. And I will literally go through and ask myself, what would I have seen or heard on a video replay of this situation? What is an actual fact versus what is just someone's opinion about this? So, you know, you never get back to me uh, in a good amount of time. What I would do is I'd be like, okay, would I see that on a video replay? Not necessarily, but I could go and I could check my emails and see when I respond and just double check and see if they have a point. So we're fact checking what they're saying. So if they're saying, you know, you, you, you obviously don't care about me. That's not something that's on a video replay. It's something I might want to 
clock for later because I, I want to demonstrate that I do care about them. But when it comes to whether there's a risk to you and your business, because a lot of us, that's what we're worried about. We're not, it's not necessarily about the fact that someone's mad at us. For some of us, it is, but it's mainly what does it mean that someone's mad at me? What does that mean about me? What does that mean about my business? Is there a legal risk here? Like, am I going to lose everything? And so when we're looking at whether there's a big risk, what I'm really interested in is has, has everybody done what they're supposed to with the contract? And what of these comments, which of these comments can be backed up with a fact? So either something I've seen or I've heard, and I would see or hear on a video replay, or something I can substantiate with, you know, the deliverable was sent to you last Friday kind of thing. So we really want to make sure that we're looking at the facts and we're not getting derailed by insults uh, or threats or that kind of thing. And the other thing I want to say is that and, and this is proven true, this is my third year in business now, is that the more successful people become, the more clients they welcome into their world, the more they're going to have problems. And they sometimes freak out and they think, oh my God, I must be doing something wrong. No, you're just growing and you're just bringing more people in. And there's a variety of people in the world. And the more you welcome in, the more you're going to see. And they're not all going to necessarily be people who are kind and assuming positive intentions and, and all of that. So when it comes to how you want to handle this, this is the Thomas Kilman conflict model. And I probably talked to you guys about this last year. This model has been around for about 50 years. This helps me with clients determine what kind of approach I want to take in a conflict. And so there are five approaches that you can sort of, you know, five categories of ways to respond. So one of them, probably, probably the easiest one for a lot of us is avoiding. So I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not even going to engage in this. I'm going to ignore this. I'm going to sweep it under the rug and I'm going to hope it just dies a natural death. And there are times when avoiding is absolutely the right thing to do. And I'll tell you about those in a second. There are also times when avoiding is definitely not helpful in those circumstances. But that's one option that's available to you. You could just be like, you know what? I'm out. I'm, I'm not even dignifying this with a response. The next one that's more on the extreme end of sort of fighting is competing. So what we're talking about with competing is sort of I'm going to, it's like one of us is not right here. One of us is not going to be happy. And I want to make sure that I'm the one who is happy at the end of the day. So when we're looking at when we might use either of those two extremes, what we're going to weigh is how important the issue is versus how important the relationship is. And not to give you, you know, flashbacks back to high school, but we're going to actually plot it on the graph here. So if the issue isn't very important and the relationship isn't very important, then maybe we don't engage at all. So, for example, if you've got somebody who's, um, you know, I'm trying to think of, of a situation where, OK, maybe you have a subcontractor and they're late by one day with something and you're kind of thinking, OK, I'm probably not going to work with a subcontractor again. So the relationship isn't really that important because it's not it's not one you want to sustain. They're late by one day. But when you look at the whole situation, the client's been well managed. Everybody's still happy. It's probably not that big a deal in the grand scheme of things. That's where avoiding might be very, very helpful um, in terms of an issue where you might compete. Oh, and I see there's something in the chat. Low and low, a brutal comment on social. Okay, so I don't know when that was said. I'm so, so oh yeah, so sorry, Mayor. Was that, oh, it was just now. Yeah, so a brutal comment on social media. So with those ones, what you want to look at is, okay, what is the risk of reputational damage with this? So if somebody's like, okay, for example, I um had a couple of videos go, I guess, mini viral on TikTok. Like I'm not like I'm not talking huge, like maybe a few thousand views. And what I noticed, this was last year when I was first getting into TikTok, I hadn't gone to get my Botox done in a while. And I have one eyebrow, this one here, that's slightly higher than the other one when my Botox wears out. Ironically, I just went and got my Botox this morning. So my eyebrow is probably like showing you what I mean right now. And do you know what happened? People on TikTok started having conversations about my eyebrows with each other and, and debating whether I had like a facial issue or whether it was Botox or whether it was just the way I did my eyebrows. 
Like this whole conversation was happening on TikTok. And at the beginning, I was a little bit taken aback and my feelings, I'm not going to lie. My feelings were kind of hurt. I was like, shit, like I'm giving you guys good value and all you can talk about is my eyebrows. And also, oh my God, does everyone know? Right? Yes. People are so bold. And I don't know if you guys have ever noticed, none of them have their pictures up ever. Like they do not have a profile picture. So that's like, for all we know, it could be somebody who's like sitting in a basement, you know, eating crackers and just like shit talking people all day. Right. So that is a situation. The issue is not that important. Those are people who are never going to hire me. And also if people are going to be talking about their eyebrows, that's just not something I need to engage with. However, if somebody were to write something online about my business and, you know, Susanna never delivers things on time. I didn't get very good value. She's such a scammer. Then I would actually be looking at, even if the, the relationship isn't that important, I would actually be looking at neutralizing that. So how I would handle that is I would publicly say, oh my goodness. So maybe, and maybe they weren't even a client. Yeah. Let's just make this easier. Maybe they're not a client and they're saying these things about me. What I would do is I publicly say, um, I don't, publicly identify my clients. However, I, I'm having difficulty uh, figuring out which client you are and whether we've actually worked together, please would you PM me so we could talk this through. I would respond to that quite publicly and I would say, I have no idea who you are. This morning, somebody was telling me she had an online review about her that said that she spent an entire appointment with someone talking about her divorce. She was never divorced. Like, so this is obviously not, and then, so she did a little bit of digging and it was some like uncle of somebody that she'd worked with who, who obviously had confused her with somebody else. That's a situation where the relationship isn't very important, but the issue is. And so you want to shut that down. But obvious, like my motto is that we do it kindly. We do it in a way that reflects well on us. So, you know, we're, we're not going to be talking about threatening lawsuits online. And in fact, that's one thing I would not do is publicly threaten a lawsuit with somebody. We've all seen how well that goes for people. Not very well. So. If the relationship is very, very important, but the issue isn't, then we start getting into accommodating. So let's say you've got a client who's, you know, huge client with you and they're upset because they thought they were going to get 750. I don't know if there's any photographers here, but, you know, 750 pictures and, you know, you only got 700 at their event and they're really, really angry. And you're like, well, I was only contractually obligated to give you 700. Is there really a problem here? But you really want to keep the client. That might be where you get to make a strategic decision that you're going to accommodate them. And you're going to, you know, not necessarily back down, but you're going to let them have this one. So this is going to be one that's great. Obviously, when you're in the wrong, you're going to want to accommodate and add value. It's also really good. It's a great way to bank favors and get some leverage. And so in a situation like that, where they're asking you essentially to over deliver, how I would handle it is I would say, you know, um, I checked our contract. Actually, the contract was only for 700 pictures, but our relationship is very important to me. And so as a professional courtesy, I would love to add blank, you know, something that feels right to me, you know, just this once kind of thing. And I would keep it very light, but saying things like our contract was this, um, and this is what I did, but because this is important, I'm going to add extra value just this once sets that expectation that this isn't going to be happening again. And so next time, if something like that happens, then you can refer back and say, you know, last time I know I was able to give you extra value. That's not something I'm able to do this time. I'm sorry. Um, and that, so kind of leaving it at that. Uh, okay. I'm ch checking the chat to make sure. Okay. If the situation, if the issue was really important, and the relationship is extremely important. So let's say, um, gosh, I, I know I can see Meredith right now. So like, let's say there's like a website issue with somebody and they still need to pay you and they need to pay like half of your bill. But the website issue is something that's that's there and it's playing. And maybe there's like a little bit of a ball drop on someone's on each of your parts that but we want to preserve the situation and we want to make sure that we're doing fair. Like, like doing what's right by everybody, that's where we look at collaborating. So with these, I'm looking at um, long-term issues. So this is not just a short-term thing. I want to be working with the other person to figure out what's important to them. You know, sometimes people will be stuck on a specific avenue of action. So they might be like, I want a whole new website when actually what they want is they want different photos, right? Like they don't necessarily need a whole new website. They just want different photos. 
but it's where that's where we really get to understanding their perspective and having a lot more of a conversation as opposed to just accommodating or capitulating. In the middle is the compromise. And the compromise, whenever I think of a compromise, I think of a mediation. I used to go to a lot of mediations and nobody was ever happy at the end of those mediations because everybody had to kind of, you know, bite their tongue and do something they really didn't want to do. So this is where, you know, you both kind of cut your losses. You say, you know what, okay, we'll, we'll each meet somewhat in the middle. Um, you know, there, you have different goals. What you want to do is you just want to shut things down. Uh, and so you sort of kind of make everybody equally unhappy. This is not necessarily the best from a business perspective. From a business perspective, I usually like to see people in the collaborating end of things. Or if they've messed something up, I want to see them in the accommodating end of things. If they actually, if the person doesn't have a point at all, then it can be appropriate to be a little bit more on the competing side because what you don't want to do is you don't want to become a sitting target. So you don't want to be getting a reputation of just rolling over every time someone, you know, kicks up a fuss. And so there have been times when strategically, when I've been representing corporations who I've identified as being a target and kind of, you know, this month's flavor of the month for getting sued, then what I've done with them is I've actually said, we're going to take a hard line on everything because we need to shut this pattern down. But for most of us in this scenario, we're not going to be looking at shutting down patterns and, you know, long-term litigation strategies. We're going to be looking at what feels right for you and your business in that moment and what's going to preserve your reputation and, you know, your good name going forward. So this can be, I like to use this a lot to help me figure out what approach I want to take. And I literally will just be like, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how important is the relationship? On a scale of one to 10, how important is this hill for me to climb slash die on? And I literally will just plot it out on the graph and then go from there. So it's an easy way to separate my emotions from the situation. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, I think I'm doing okay for time, which is awesome. Okay, so I'm just going to take a sip. Don't judge me. I'm totally drinking Diet Coke right now because it makes me more sprightly for presentations. So just one sec. Okay, I know I promised you guys my top five do's and don'ts. I have so many that I can't pick. So I'm going to try to give as much value as I can in this. But I, um, I did come up with five do's and don'ts for you guys. So without further ado, don't wait too long to respond. Now, instead, do buy yourself a little bit of time if you need to investigate. And oh, thank you, Louise, for not judging. Thank you. <laughs> this is why I love this group. You guys are all so awesome. Okay, so don't wait too long to respond. Do buy yourself some time if you need to investigate. So when I've presented to this group before, I've talked about the importance of doing your own investigation. We touched on that a little bit about figuring out if the client has a point. But to buy yourself some time, what you want to do, if someone sends you an email and they're really upset, you want to respond with something like, dear client, you know, hi client, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. I can tell this is very important for you and client satisfaction is always something that's important for me. I would like to look into this a little bit further. I will get back to you in one business day, two business days, whatever seems reasonable with the next steps or with my thoughts. Thank you so much for your patience. If you have any more information in the meantime, please let me know. You can even chat GPT this shit, guys. Like I think chat GPT is wonderful. The trick is having the judgment to know whether you should use what it spits out at you. But chat GPT is great for just one of those things that's like, I just need to buy myself some time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as a sole proprietor, you're terrified of getting a bad review on Google. Absolutely. Um, and what we tend to do when people get bad reviews on Google is we flood, we flood it with good reviews. <laughs> like that's it sounds really simple, but that's what people do. And yes, Kate, ChatGPT is wonderful for writing conflict emails. And you know, it's it's definitely been something what I've noticed my clients do, and it's great because it saves them money and it saves them time, is they'll come to me, they'll be like, okay, ChatGPT sent me these two things. What do we pick? And we can sort of craft something really quickly that way. But using language like what I just gave you to buy yourself a little bit of time, first of all, you can have it saved 
as a template in your emails, like the buy my time template. So when you see this come in, you just click that, you've sent it, you've, you've acknowledged the complaint, you've told the client they're important to you because when people get pissed, what they're really mad about in a conversation is they think you don't respect them at the end of the day. They think mutual respect is gone. And then they also think they're not going to get what they want. And so um, Crucial Conversations is a great framework for navigating conflict. And they talk about establishing mutual respect and mutual purpose, which even if you don't have the same goal, at least we want the goals to align. So when people see that you've responded right away and you're acknowledging that the issue is important to them, you're reestablishing that mutual respect and mutual purpose and you're turning the temperature down. You are also subconsciously planting a seed in their brain that you are not the enemy. Because if they're that mad at you that they're writing an email, they are probably telling themselves a story that you are a villain and they're martyring themselves. Like a lot of people who've been hurt in the past will go from feeling very victimized and kind of, you know, giving in at the first instance to being like, no, fuck you. Like, I'm going to defend myself. Like, I've had enough. And that's, I think, better than being in a victim mindset. But it's more antagonistic. And a lot of people don't want to do business with someone like that. So we want to subconsciously plant the seed that we're not the enemy, we're on the same side, and we're going to get back to them with the good response. And if you guys join my email list, if you're not already on it, I can find the link in a second and put it on there. I have an unimpeachable email framework. So you can literally like take that email and be like, I need an empathy statement. I need this. I need that. And it will tell you how to write these things in a way that's very personal persuasive and will read well to other people if they need to, if they need to see it for whatever reason. So the next one I've already touched on. Oh, I see a chat message. Hang on. That's gold. Cool. Oh, good. I'm glad. Okay, good. So yeah, I'll make sure I stick the link up there guys. Um, and I'll get it in a second. Um, okay. So the next one is don't hesitate to refer the client to your contract. And there's a way to do this. Like, obviously you don't necessarily want to be like, you know, no, it's in our contract. But what I like to do sometimes with that email framework where I say, you know, I start with an empathy statement. So like I come in peace, then I give my, I'll just tell you what the email framework is, my bottom line up front. So I've looked into this and I am not prepared to do X, Y, and Z. Here's why. And I give my context and my, con and I always say it in a way that's neutral. So if it sounds like I'm giving advice, if it sounds like I'm telling someone off, then I need to rephrase because I don't want to say like that because we've all been on the receiving end of that and it never plays well. So in my context, I'll say, you know, referring back to our contract, I see that I am supposed to give you this. This was delivered on such and such a time. Uh, so having looked into it and seeing that my contractual obligations have been fulfilled, I still understand you're unhappy uh, so what, you know, and I'll kind of go from there. It's hard to kind of riff when I don't have a specific example in mind, but what I'll do when I'm talking about the contract is I'll actually take the wording of the contract and stick it in there and say, this is what the contract says. I also, at the end of almost every conflict email, I call it my leaving the door open statement. I will say something like if I have misunderstood anything, or if I've left anything out, please let me know. I always, always, always leave the door open to the possibility that I might have something wrong. And the reason for that is that I used to go into these things like, like a peacock being like, no, I've got it right. And it's very embarrassing when someone's like, well, actually you didn't think of this. And it's just much better for everybody if you leave the door open to the possibility that there might be something that you forgot. Because a lot of us have very, very busy cognitive loads these days and we don't always think of everything. So bonding over that shared human experience is very healing in these scenarios. Okay, so the next one, this is sort of an obvious one from TikTok. You know, don't say I'm sorry you feel that way. And there are times when I help clients deal with high conflict personality people and they, you can usually spot them pretty quickly because they'll make things personal. Like they use um, what this gentleman, Bill Eddy, who came up with the theory calls blame speak. Like it's all your fault. It's all or nothing. They'll, you know, call you names. Um, they'll usually have a really um, intense emotional reaction to something which doesn't really, you know, doesn't land. Uh, and they'll tend to kind of stir stuff up and they sort of thrive on the drama. So Bill Eddy, who is also a lawyer and he's a therapist, he says, actually, don't apologize at all. 
So instead you could say something like, I regret that this has happened. You know, I was disappointed to read that you weren't satisfied, but he would say, don't apologize. I'm not as hard on on that just because I think sometimes what people want to hear is I'm sorry and actually I was talking to somebody last night who's been in a conflict with a loved one for over a year and when I asked why it wasn't resolved she said they're refusing to apologize like and and that's just insane right that's really sad but they, they and she and she wasn't just saying like and I'm sorry you feel that way it was like I am sorry I hurt your feelings and the conflict's been going on for a year and now she's hiring me to deal with it so not a good idea to, to not apologize. Sometimes just read the room. The other thing is that I think everybody here is based in Ontario, but we have an apology act here in Ontario. So if you apologize for, for something and then, you know, in the moment, like, let's say you rear end somebody with your, your car and you get out and you're like, I'm so sorry, just because you apologize that that alone doesn't mean that a court's going to find you liable. So you can apologize without it coming back to haunt you. And it can be very, very disarming. I'm so sorry. I hope you guys can't hear those email notifications, but let me just get out of that. Okay. So instead, express empathy for the situation. And I could talk all day about how to express empathy for a situation, but there are two key things which are always really helpful one is acknowledging their experience of it. So, you know, I'm sensing that this is really upsetting or even, you know, yeah, it's reasonable that you would be upset about this. And then also validating it. So you're kind of like naming the like, whoa, you know, this is clearly a big deal. I see it. And it's reasonable that it would be a big deal. A lot of, you know, it's common. People, would, people in your shoes would feel that way. So that's a really good way of expressing some empathy for the situation it is surprisingly effective at chilling people out. I can tell you that acknowledging and validating has been very helpful for um, my relationship with my stepdaughter because sometimes what people want is they just want to be heard. Like they just want to, you know, be able to talk and be heard and know that you care. So that's a golden, golden, golden tip. Okay, I'll just make sure there's nothing in the chat. We're good. Okay. Don't be too vague in your response. And I'm going to actually just skip to the to the next one. So do give context for your decisions. So, and I don't think anybody here would do this, but I have seen it before, which is like, no, I'm not going to do that. It's not in our contract. And I have seen people respond that way. And actually it's better to give context. So, you know, I'm not prepared to do that at this time. As you'll see in our contract, we had agreed for this exchange of services and I don't have the capacity to extend that unless we were to talk about expanding the scope of our agreement. Giving that extra bit of context so that the person knows you've thought about it. Studies have actually shown, this is mainly in leadership, but studies have shown that people are generally speaking a lot more amenable to things not going their way if they've at least felt heard and if they feel like their thoughts were considered. So if you're a leader and you're like, I'm not going to go that way, it's actually better to say, you know what, I've heard you and I've given that a lot of thought and I'm going to go this direction and here's why. And people tend to accept that a lot more than just a blanket. No, because don't forget, ego is very powerful. And if mutual respect and mutual purpose go out the window, we're going to have a problem. Okay, the very last one, don't assume this is going to stay between you. And I was talking about this a little bit earlier when I was saying, you know, this, the email framework is good in case other people need to see it. So I always will write, think I write for the judge. <laughs> Essentially, I, if I'm dealing with the conflict email for clients, I will always write assuming that a judge is going to read what I have, what I've said on their behalf. And I'll go strike for my clients because I also have a theory that when you get a third person involved, it, it can really turn up the dial and the drama of the situation. And so if I can help my clients solve it themselves, that's always so much better for everybody. But when I go strike things for them, I'm always thinking, how would a judge read this? Or in this day and age, and I'm sorry that we're in this, in this day and age, how would this look if the person posted it on social media? you know, is this unimpeachable? It's my favorite word. You know, is this one of those things where if someone even posted like a snippet of this on social media, I could turn around and post the entire thing and say, this is the context and stand behind it. Because if you're, I did a post on this yesterday. If you're worried about what other people think of you, one of the best things you can do to protect yourself in that scenario is to 
act the way you would want to be seen to act, you know, be the person that you want people to perceive you to be and think of yourself that way. And then they won't mess with you as much. And the irony of all of this is that I've now learned how to manage my experience of conflict. And I knock on wood, short of like the typical teenage stuff, which that's no one's fault, right? Teenagers, it's tough to be a teenager these days. I don't really get in fights with people anymore. The conflict is always way below my threshold and it just becomes a discussion and something that's really easy to manage. So this is very, I know it seems common sense and stupidly simple, which is actually kind of the point. I wanted to make it simple for you guys. This stuff is so effective, so effective. So those are my top five do's and don'ts. I am here ready, willing, and able to answer questions for you guys. So lay it on me. How can I help? I just want to start by saying, Susanna, that um, what I've learned in my work with you for, was it two or three years now, mm -hmm. is um, the framework in which you can apply so much of this. And you may remember this, but I've had a few times where, you know, the heat is up in certain situations and clients have literally said this, like, I applaud your grace in this situation. You have made what I thought was, you know, this negative situation and reversed it to actually leave an even better, more positive outcome. So um, I think all of these tools, even if you're just able to kind of remember a couple of yeah. them to start, can really, you know, change the way it goes. And as somebody who does, you phrased it like um, there's very specific situations where my nervous system gets triggered and I can't think anymore. And so to have those really quick tools, I'm able to actually still move forward in the best way possible, even though like I'm a ball of anxiety <laughs> on the other end. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah. so that's my, my personal experience, um, through using a lot of these, these tips. So thank you for sharing yeah. that. And yeah. And, and, you know, I know you and I work together and, and our work, Typically speaking, when I work with people at the beginning, it's a little bit more intensive because we have to kind of unlearn some of those things that we learned in childhood and high school and all that stuff. But now it's usually just a quick, like, boom, 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 back and forth. And it's solved. Right. Yeah. Which is amazing. Evolved quite a bit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So I see, okay. So I yeah, see so some funny. stuff here. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, okay. So Kate, I just saw Kate's, um, thank you, Kate. That is so, yeah, you haven't had to reach out to me for a long time, which I love I and mean, I miss you, but I'm really happy for you that you haven't had to do that, which is amazing. So I'll just go up to the top. Okay. An example of competing versus collaborating. Um, thanks for that question, Annie. So yeah, competing. One of the ways that you compete is saying, fuck you. I'll see you in court or threatening a lawsuit. Uh, collaborating is, okay, how can we sort this out together um, and sort of reestablishing that mutual respect and, and mutual purpose. Um, another way to compete in a kinder way is simply to say, I've reviewed the contract and my respectful view is that I have satisfied my obligations under the contract. Uh, I would be very curious to hear more about your perspective on this, but at the moment, with the information I have, I'm not really prepared to make an exception to what we agreed to. That's a very polite way of saying no, but it's just boundaries, right? It's just like, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, whereas collaborating might be more like, oh, you know, um, and again, this is if the, if the, if the issue is important, if the relationship is important, might be, can we hop on a call and talk a little bit about how we can solve this? Because I'd like to find a, a solution that is not only fair to both of us, but is honorable to the situation. Um, that I, I saw that um, work. I, I, I saw someone say that at a mediation years ago, and it was one of those scenarios where I didn't think it was horrible, 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 horrible situation. My client was definitely at fault. Um, and we, I didn't, I thought I was going to be raked over the coals and I was a young, I was a baby lawyer at the time. So my boss came in to do the heavy lifting at the beginning and do the, the spiel. And I heard him say that. And it just, it was, it was amazing how the tension just lifted and we were able to actually come to a solution. And cause I was on the defense side. I always look, I want the fair solution, 
but we give a range of what's fair. And so you're always kind of shooting for the lower end of the range. And then, you know, the good lawyers can push it a little bit more. And we were able to get it down to the lower end of the range, which was just wonderful for our clients because they were really worried about this. Mm -hmm. So that can really work. Have I noticed a shift or rise in conflict since the pandemic? Yes, Nikisha. Oh my gosh, <laughs> so much. Um, I was saying this a couple of years ago, actually, and I was blaming it on the pandemic. So actually, I'm thank you for sharing that with me because um, that validates my thought, which was that, yeah, I think people are crazier <laughs> than, than before. Um, we are so like the world is polarized right now. Like there's, you know, people are asking you to take a stand on things that we have no business taking a stand on. Um, you know, a lot of us have to, a lot of us have a lot of learning to do. I think the issues have become, there are issues that were there before the pandemic, which came out just either because of the pandemic or during the pandemic, which needed to be addressed. And I think some of us are doing better at reckoning, you know, reconciling, not reckoning, but reconciling those issues and do, you know, repairing th than others. And so, yeah. And I think honestly, um, not to get political on you guys, but some of the some of the stuff that we're hearing from politicians doesn't help either. So one of my missions, uh, I have two, is I like to help people not be personally victimized by these situations because I've been hurt. Like I'm sensitive. Like I I'm an empath. I can feel hurt when it feels like someone doesn't like me. I've had to work on that. So I I want to help people not feel that same pain. The other thing is I want us to be able to come together because some of these issues that have been coming up where, you know, people are more angry than usual, it's usually anger is a symptom of a problem. And so if we can speak about it and be open and talk about it, I think that's when the world is really going to improve. Just my two cents. That's my, that's my soapbox rant for the day. Um, and that, yeah. And then Kate uh, was just saying, yeah, Kate and I have also worked together and I'm just so delighted, Kate. And it looks like from your Instagram, everything's going really well. So I'm so, so happy to hear that. And I'm happy to hear that the tools are working. So, yeah. Does anyone um, else have anything? Oh, I just heard someone. What I'll do is I'll just stink, stink, excuse me. I'll stick the link um, for that email, um, for my email list in the, um, in the chat for you guys. You'll get three emails to begin with. And so I have a conflict playbook that you guys can get for free. Uh, let me just copy this. Um, then I also give a free masterclass as well. Uh, and the email framework, I think I give the email framework. If I don't, if you guys just add yourself to my email list and shoot me a line here, I will send you my email framework. All included in the replay too, Susanna. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. And I have a podcast as well. And I love doing question and answer on my podcast. If you guys are like, I have a burning question and I would love an answer and I don't want to pay for it. I totally respect that, by the way. Just send me a DM. Oh, thanks, Karen. Yeah. Hi, Karen. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, yeah. Send me a DM, um, you know, and I'll answer it on my podcast or I'll answer it in socials. I'm totally happy to engage that way too. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. All right. I will, uh, as usual, send the replay out um, once it's downloaded. And honestly, once I have lunch. <laughs> I always do these over yeah. lunch. <laughs> but um, I'll make sure all your contacts information is in that replay so people can reach out to you. Again, I think um, what you do is so transformative for small business owners. So thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. It's so nice to be here and thanks for inviting me and thanks for of coming. Course. Of course. All right. Bye everyone. Bye guys.